أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن الأنعام حمولة وفرشا كلوا مما رزقكم الله ولا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 142 of Surah Al-An'am He says And it is he who produces the cattle Some, some are carriers of burden And some for slaughter Eat of that which God has provided you And follow not the footsteps of Satan Truly he is a manifest enemy unto you now, in verse number 141, we read that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks of the diversity of the crops and the vegetation that He has created for us. Now, similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this verse, He speaks about the diversity of cattle, the diversity of the animals that He has created for the benefit of human beings. Now, in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَمِنَ الْأَنْعَامِ حَمُولَةً وَفَرْشًا He has created cattle. Some of them are carriers of burden. Hamulatan comes from the word ham, which means, to, uh, which means a burden or a weight, something to carry. So in this verse, Allah is speaking about the blessing of the diversity of cattle. Allah has created some cattle, some livestock that are very large. You know, for example, camels, horses. These are animals that are large in size. And one of their uses in Arabia, in 7th century Arabia, the Arabs used to rely heavily on camels and horses for the transport of their goods. They were, you know, instrumental in the movement of goods from Syria to Yemen through different parts of the Arabian Peninsula. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is recounting the blessings of these cattle and, and the various uses for them. So Allah says that in the same way that I created diverse crops, I have created diversity in the cattle that I have created for you. And they serve many purposes, they serve many functions. One of them is that they carry your goods, hamulatan, or they carry the individual. And then Allah says, وَفَرْشًا And some of them are used for slaughter, for consumption. Now, the Arabs very rarely would eat the meat of horses and even camels. They wouldn't typically eat camel meat unless it was necessary for them because, again, the primary use of camels and horses in Arabia was for transportation. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have created some cattle as farshan. Now it's interesting that the word that's used here, the word farsh in the Arabic language literally means to spread something out. And it was typically used in reference to rugs or carpets. In the Arabic language, a carpet is called farsh because you spread it on the ground. But some commentators of the Holy Quran, they see that this word actually refers to animals that are slaughtered for meat consumption because the idea is that when you slaughter an animal, you lay it down on the ground, you spread its limbs, and you prepare for the, the act of slaughtering. So the animals that are created to, as carriers of burden are typically the large animals. You know, as I mentioned, examples like camels and horses. Smaller animals were, were used for 
the, for meat consumption, you know, animals like goats and sheep. Now, other scholars say that the word farshan is actually used in its literal sense here because the Arabs, they would, they would basically create and they would manufacture their carpets and their rugs from the hides of these animals, from the wool of the, the sheep. So the Quran is mentioning, you know, two important uses for, for these cattle, that they're used for the transport of goods, they carry burdens, and they also have an ornamental function. You know, they're used for the furnishings, the coverings, and the rugs that, uh, that the Arabs used to make. Now, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, essentially he's speaking about the usefulness of the cattle that he has created. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that you, you use them for the transportation of your goods. You use them to provide warmth for yourselves. You know, your, a lot of, some of their clothes were made from the fur and the hide of the, uh, the, or the wool of the cattle. They'd use them to make their rugs and their carpets. They use, they use them for clothing, as I mentioned, for food, for drink, and even for beautification. You know, sometimes they would take certain body parts of the animal as, you know, to make necklaces or for ornamental purposes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here speaks about the diversity of the cattle, of the animals that he has created as a sign of his beneficence to humanity. So in the same way we see diversity in vegetation and crops, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the diverse types of cattle that he has created for the use and for the benefit of human beings. Now, after mentioning Allah says, eat of what he has provided you. Eat of what God has provided you. Now, of course, the word kulu is a commanding verb. Eat of what God has provided you. But in the Arabic language, you know, in the Arabic language, most of the time, a commanding verb is going to indicate obligation. For example, when Allah says, Aqim as salah, establish prayer, we understand obligation from that. Because a commanding verb, the default understanding of a commanding verb is that it denotes obligation. But here, obviously, we're not being, it's not an obligation for us to eat, you know, the meat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided. Rather, it's an indication of permissibility. In the same way, if you go to your doctor and your doctor says, you know, eat, eat sweets, you know, after he has, you know, prohibited you from eating them, eat sweets, in that case, is a command which indicates permissibility. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because it, remember, remember in the previous verses, we were speaking about the arbitrary dietary restrictions that the Arabs were imposing upon themselves. So here Allah is saying that the livestock that I have created, it serves many purposes. There are many uses. You use these animals to carry your burdens for transport, and you can use them for, for slaughter or for for your to, for your furnishings to create rugs and carpets therefore eat of what god has provided you now the command to eat what god has provided is combined with the subsequent warning to not follow the footsteps of satan so if you read the verse allah says eat of of which eat of that which God has provided you and follow not the footsteps of Satan. So there must be some connection between food consumption and following in the footsteps of Satan. Now, as I mentioned in our last session, we spoke about these baseless dietary laws that the Arabs had imposed on themselves. And we, we mentioned that the reason why this was so problematic was because they were making these prohibitions and they were ascribing them to God. So not only were they, they, not only were they refraining from certain types of meat, 
They were claiming that it has a religious basis, and that is very dangerous to ascribe, to falsely ascribe laws to God that have no basis, because this can lead to, to deviation. You know, this can turn people away from religion. And, you know, so the Arabs are, are making, are placing all of these un, these baseless restrictions in the name of religion. And because they're making religion so complex, this could potentially turn people away from faith. And subhanAllah, you know, we, we do the same thing in our communities, right? We impose, you know, restrictions and prohibitions that have no basis in the in Sharia. And they're they're essentially cultural prohibitions, but we frame them as religious prohibitions, and this is something that's very dangerous because it turns people away from faith, because they develop the impression that Islam is so strict, Islam is so restrictive. When in reality, these are things that are being fabricated and they're being falsely attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, eat of what God has provided you and do not follow in the footsteps of Satan. So there's a relationship between eating and following the footsteps of Satan. Now it's interesting that you know, people, unfortunately, they have a tendency to underestimate the effect of food and drink on their spirituality. You know, people, they ask, you know, why does it matter what I eat as long as I'm, I'm a good person, as long as I have a good heart? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse essentially reminds us that what you consume has an effect on your spirituality. You may, you, may, you may not notice anything observable. You may be eating haram food and you're technically physically healthy, but you're all, you also have a soul. You know, there's a spiritual component to man that cannot be ignored. So people have a tendency to underestimate the impact of food and drink on spirituality. They belittle it. Secondly, as I mentioned, when you when you fall when you falsely ascribe prohibitions to God, you may see it as something that's not a big deal. But these are the footsteps of Shaytan. You're following in the footsteps because Shaytan, when he leads people astray, he does it gradually. You know, footsteps indicate a gradual movement in a specific direction. Yeah. And this is how shaitan operates. Shaitan tempts you to gradually commit sin. You know, it's, it's like the idea of, you know, if, if I take, if I boil water and I put your hand in it, you're immediately going to remove your hand because you feel the intense heat. But if I put your hand, if you dip your hand in lukewarm water and I slowly raise the temperature, right? You're not going to experience that shock value because it was done gradually. So one of the tactics of shaitan is that he doesn't make you commit major sins, yeah? He, ma he makes you commit, he whispers into your heart to commit minor sins, and they, on those minor sins become the stepping stones to major sins. This is why we have a hadith from Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida alayhi salam, where he says, beware of minor sins because they lead to major sins. Because major sins, you know, people don't commit murder overnight, right? They don't commit major, they don't commit zina overnight. They commit the smaller sins and they eventually lead to those greater sins. So Allah says, do not follow in the footsteps of shaitan. In the next verse, in verse 143, Allah says, ثَمَانِيَةَ أَزْوَاجٍ مِّنَ الضَّأْنِ اثْنَيْنِ وَمِنَ الْمَعْزِ اثْنَيْنِ قُلْ آذَّكَرَيْنِ حَرَّمَ أَمِ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ أَمَّا اشْتَمَلَتْ عَلَيْهِ أَرْحَامُ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ نَبِّئُونِي بِعِلْمٍ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ 
In verse 143, Allah says, eight pairs of sheep, two, and of goats, two. Say, is it the two males he has forbidden or the two females or that which the wombs of the two females contain? Tell me with knowledge if you are truthful. And I'll read the next verse because they're connected to each other. وَمِنَ الْإِبِلِ اثْنَيْنِ وَمِنَ الْبَقَرِ اثْنَيْنِ قُلْ آذَّكَرَيْنِ حَرَّمَ أَمِ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ أَمَّ اشْتَمَلَتْ عَلَيْهِ أَرْحَامُ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ أَمْ كُنْتُمْ شُهَدَاء إِذْ وَصَّاكُمُ اللَّهُ بِهَذَا فَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا لِيُضِلَّ النَّاسَ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 144, He says, And of camels, two. And of oxen, two. Say, is it the two males He has forbidden, or the two females? Or that which the wombs of the two females contain? Or were you present when God enjoined, that, enjoined this upon you? Who does greater wrong than the one who fabricates a lie against God? that they may lead people astray without knowledge. Truly, God does not guide the wrongdoers. Now, the eight pairs that Allah is speaking about is a continuation of the, of the previous verse where Allah was speaking about cattle. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the, the male and the female of the four classes of livestock. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions sheep, male and female sheep, and he mentions goats, male and female, so that's four. And then he mentions camels, male and female, and then he mentions oxen or cows, male and female. So that, that's eight. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asks, because in, the, in, the, in our last session we spoke about how the Arabs had this belief that only men were allowed to consume the the meat of the infant you know when when the female gives birth only men are permitted to eat that meat if the if it's a miscarriage and the child and, and the uh the baby comes out dead then they're both permitted to eat so again just arbitrary dietary restrictions that have no basis so allah is asking them is it, the, is it the male that's forbidden or is it the female? Is, it, is what's contained in the womb forbidden? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, you know, these are you know, rhetorical questions and Allah in a way is mocking the, uh, the Arabs, the, the pagans, you know, for their, again, for their arbitrary prohibitions. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks them that were you present and kuntum shuhada idh wasakum Allahu bihada? You know, the, the beauty, the, what's beautiful about Islam is that you notice that when Allah engages with these people who, who engage in these religious customs and they claim that these religious customs have a religious basis. What's beautiful is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala time and time again asks them, what's your evidence for this? You claim that this is from me, that I enjoined this upon you. What's your dalil? Are you referring to a scripture? Is there a prophet? Is there a rasul that taught you this? And this should train us, my dear brothers and sisters. Whenever we see any custom or practice in our own communities, in our Husayniyat, in our mosques, we should develop the habit of, is there a dalil for this? Is this based on a hadith? Is this based on a Quranic verse? We, we shouldn't be like you know sheep who just blindly follow. When you see a, a practice in a masjid or a Husayniya or in your community at large, in the same way that Allah is asking, is this based on ilm? Is this based on a dalil? Is this based on scriptural evidence? Is this based on reason? 
We also need to develop this habit of asking for proof, asking for evidence. So just, just because something is common, commonly practiced, that doesn't mean that it has a religious foundation. You know, there's a, there's a phrase among the ulama, Rabba mashhurin la asla lahu. There can be many cases where something is mashhur, something is very prominent and widely practiced, but it has no basis. It has no basis. For example, I've been to certain communities where on the 10th of Muharram, they say that it's haram to say salam alaykum. They say it's haram to say salam alaykum. What this, now this could be a cultural practice, that's fine. But to attribute this to Islam, to say it is a sin, to say assalamu alaikum on the day of, of Ashura, what's the delete for this? So we also need to develop the habit of asking for evidence for, uh, for any practice, even if it becomes widely embraced by the masses. So Allah is asking them, were you present? So you claim that certain types of meat are forbidden for men, permissible for women, and vice versa. Allah says, Am kuntum shuhada Were you present when Allah enjoyed this upon you? And then Allah says, فَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا Who does greater wrong than the one who fabricates a lie against God? As I mentioned, brothers and sisters, it's one thing to be misguided, right? If you want to engage in certain baseless rituals that have no, that have no evidence, that are not supported by Quran or Ahadith, that's your business. But to impose it on others, you know, to, to falsely ascribe it to Allah, to the Holy Prophet, to the Ahlul Bayt, this is the greatest crime. Because not only are you misguided, you are now actively misguiding other people. You're introducing a bid'ah that may be embraced for many generations. Until today, brothers and sisters, how many Muslims around the world perform salat with taraweeh? If you go, most Muslim countries, many of the mosques around the world in the month of Ramadan, they stand and they offer this prayer, thinking that it's a good thing, right? It began with one man who said that, you know, in my opinion, mustahab prayer should be held in jama'ah, right? One bid'ah, it's embraced, and then it becomes allegedly part of the sunnah of the Prophet. So this is the danger of making false attributions to Allah, to His Messenger, to the Ahlul Bayt. Because not only can you misguide the people during your time, it could potentially become embraced to such an extent that people practice it for generations and then on the day of judgment you have to stand before Allah and answer to Him as to why you led all of these people astray. You claim that this was the sunnah of the Prophet and people performed this act thinking that it would bring them closer to Allah but in fact it wasn't the sunnah of the Prophet. Now you and I, we may do this on a, on a smaller scale in our families, in our communities. So we have to be cautious. So Allah says, were you present when, when I enjoined this? In verse number 145, now here the Prophet is told to respond. In ayah number 145, Allah says, قُلْ لَا أَجِدُوا فِي مَا فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ فَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Say, O Muhammad, so the, Allah is, is informing the Prophet, He's commanding the Prophet to tell them, Say, I do not find within that which is revealed to me anything forbidden to one who would eat unless it be a dead animal, meytatan, or blood spilled out, 
number two, or the flesh of swine, chenzia, for indeed it is impure. Indeed it is impure, it refers to meita, the the daman uh, masfuhan, and the flesh of the swine. So this is three things. And then, or a sinful offering, a sinful offering dedicated to other than God. So you slaughter an animal and you don't invoke Allah's name. You invoke an idol's name. You invoke something other than God. Allah calls this a sinful act. I mean, I mean, how can you how how disrespectful is that? That in, you know, you you mention the name. You don't mention the name of the Lord who created this animal. It's almost like, you know, there's a dinner that was held and someone in the community, imagine Brother Zayn, for example. He, he, he invites the entire community for a community dinner. He sponsored it. He prepares the food. And then someone gets up and thanks someone who had nothing to do with the dinner. Imagine, imagine how insulting that is. That you offer that some this the person who's someone stands up and offers thanks to someone who had nothing to do with the preparation of the meal, who didn't pay a single dollar, who didn't set the table, who didn't pay for the food or prepare it. We would consider that deeply insulting and disrespectful. But there are people who mention who invoke the name of other than Allah when they slaughter these animals and they want to enjoy Allah's rizq. Or a sinful offering dedicated to other than God. But whoever is compelled by necessity without willfully disobeying or transgressing, truly your Lord is forgiving and merciful. So Rasulullah in this ayah is instructed to respond to the Meccans various ritual prohibitions concerning the animals whose meat may be consumed. Now it seems that, you know, if we go through the list, so the Prophet mentions Meita. So Allah says, so as a response to them that the Holy Prophet says that Meita is forbidden, right? The Arabs were known for eating carcasses. They were known for eating Meita. So the Prophet says, you know, the things that you were forbidding is actually permissible. What is forbidden is meita. Daman masfuhan. When you slaughter an animal, blood spills out. You know, especially when you cut the uh, the jugular, the carotid, blood spills out of the body. That blood is nejis. You can't consume it. But the blood that is that remains inside. That's tahir and it's permissible for you to consume. So the blood that spills out, you're not allowed to consume that. A dead animal, you're not allowed to consume it. The flesh of swine, khinzir, you're not permitted to consume it, right? And this this was even even the Jews and the Christians. This is mentioned even in the Torah and Injil. This is not something that's that's new. But again, it seems that some of the Arabs were consuming the uh, uh, the swine. And then number four, fisqan uhilla li ghayrillah. So the first three are inherently unlawful, right? There is nothing that you can do that can make meita halal. There is nothing that you can do that can make spilled blood, you know, blood that spills out of the body of an animal that you're sacrificing. There's no way that you can make that halal. That's inherently prohibited for you to eat. The meat of the this the flesh of swine inherently prohibited but the fourth is not necessarily inherently forbidden this could be a, this could be meat that is permissible for you to eat but what made it haram is that one of the conditions of slaughtering the animal wasn't met you know there are a number of conditions the 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 person who's slaughtering the animal has to be muslim doesn't have to be uh, Shia Ithna Ashri, the Risala Amali of all of the Maraja indicate that they have to be Muslim. You have to, it's mustahab, you know, to give it water to reduce its suffering. You direct its, you know, its legs towards the uh, Qibla when you put it down. 
and you invoke the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also mustahab to, to sharpen the blade. So these are some of the conditions that have to be met, even when you're dealing with an animal whose meat is, is permissible to consume. But these conditions of dhab have to be met. Now, this ayah, you have to keep in mind, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not telling the Prophet to, to list the to list all of the the things that are forbidden because we know that there are other types of meat that are forbidden this response of the prophet is is basically a, a conversation regarding the pro, the false prohibitions that they introduced because we know that you know carnivorous animals the meat of carnivorous animals is is uh, is prohibited so this verse is not giving us a comprehensive list of all the things that the Sharia has forbidden. The, this conversation here is in reference to what the, what the Arabs had made permissible and what they had made for, forbidden, and this relates to that conversation. So it's all, I'll give you a, a, an example to kind of illustrate what I mean. If, if someone claims that, has, that you, know, you know, Muhammad and Ja'far, both came to my house and that was a false statement and i want to refute that by saying only muhammad came not jafar now when i say only muhammad came to my house not jafar that doesn't mean that there weren't other people present my response is limited to refuting the statement so if someone says Muhammad and Ja'far were at Sheikh Azhar's house, and I say Muhammad was there, not Ja'far, that doesn't mean that there was only one person in my house. It could mean that there were others present, but my response was aimed at refuting that false claim. Do you see what I mean? So here the Prophet is not giving a comprehensive list of the things that are prohibited. He's giving a list that is appropriate, that is an appropriate response, that's an appropriate refutation to these baseless dietary restrictions that were imposed by the Arabs. Verse number 146. <laughs> And to those who are Jews, we forbade every animal with claws. And of oxen and sheep, we forbade them their fat, except what is upon their backs or found in their intestines or what is joined with bone. Thus did we recompense them for their willful disobedience, and surely we are truthful. Now, in this verse, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the dietary prohibitions that were imposed by Allah upon Bani Israel. Now, Brothers and sisters, you know that when the Holy Prophet began his prophetic mission in Mecca, there were many Jews that had settled in the Arabian Peninsula because it was written in their scriptures that the final prophet of God would emerge in the Arab lands. But when they saw that this man was from the line of Ismail, you know, because of their own prejudice, they refused to support him. They belied him. They rejected him. So one of their, they, and they would give many reasons why they, they refused to follow the Holy Prophet. One of the things that they would mention, one of their arguments is that the Prophet is, is permitting that which was forbidden by Ibrahim. So basically, they, they were claiming that the dietary restrictions that they followed 
were traceable to Ibrahim alayhi salam, that they existed even before the Torah. And therefore, what, what, uh, what Muhammad is introducing goes against the practice of Ibrahim. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this verse, he says that he forbade every animal with claws and of oxen and sheep the fat that grows on their backs and their intestines so the jews were not allowed to eat fat that was on the backs of these animals on the backs of oxen and sheep no they were they were not allowed to eat the fat except the fat that was on the backs or in the intestines so you see that the dietary restrictions in Jewish law is a lot more strict than the dietary restrictions in Islamic law. So you find that the, the Jews, they would reject the Prophet on the basis that you're making permissible what, what is forbidden, right? So they're saying that this is proof that you're a false prophet because you are making halal what is haram now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here at the end of the ayah what does he say so they, they claim that this was always the case that these dietary restrictions existed all the way back to the time of ibrahim because they claim ibrahim for themselves they say that he was a jew christians say that he was a christian right they everyone claims ibrahim for themselves so Allah says, I, I forbade them the every animal with claws. They were not allowed to eat any carnivorous animals, which is similar to us. But they were also prohibited from eating the fat of the animals, except the fat that's on the backs of oxen and sheep or in the intestines, or except the fat that is attached to the bone. Now, Allah says, these prohibitions, these, res these dietary restrictions, were imposed on Bani Israel because of their disobedience. So it seems that their Sharia initially was very, very easy, that there were there were there were virtually very few prohibitions, but restrictions were imposed upon them as a punishment from Allah. Now, the reason why I say that is if you go to Surah at Surah Ali Imran. Verse 93, Surah 3, verse 93. What does Allah say? It's a very interesting verse. Allah says, Kullu ta'am kan hillan li bani Israel illa ma harram Israelu ala nafsi min qabli an tunazzalat tawrat. Allah says, All food was permissible for the children of Israel. So everything was halal for them, except that which Israel made forbidden upon himself. Now Israel is a reference to who? It's a reference to Ya'qub, right? One of the titles of Ya'qub, Ya'qub was the father of Yusuf, the son of Ishaq, right? So Ya'qub is the grand grandson of Ibrahim. So everything, so Bani Israel are who? Bani Israel are the children of Prophet Ya'qub, right? That's why Allah in the Quran, He has such high expectations from them. You're the children of a prophet. You are the bearers of the message. Allah is going to hold you to a higher standard. So in this verse, Allah says, All food was permissible for the children of Israel, except that which Israel, meaning Ya'qub, forbade upon himself some commentators say because of his zuhud you know just like Ali ibn Abi Talib Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, he would eat the most simple food he did not allow himself to eat many types of food that were permissible you think Amir al-Mu'mineen was eating sweets day and night there were many foods that the Imam would not eat not because it was haram because he held himself to a higher degree of zuhud asceticism yeah so Allah says all food was permissible upon the children of Israel except that which Israel made forbidden upon himself before 
the Torah was revealed. So the Torah was the book that introduced a lot of these restrictions. Because of their treatment of Musa salam, Allah imposed many dietary restrictions on them. Now what were the sins that they committed that caused Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the sharia very difficult upon them as a punishment? If you go to Surah An-Nisa, Surah number 4, verses 160 to 161. I'll just click quickly, read it for you, and you can kind of you know do your own research. Allah says, Because of the injustice and the wrongdoing of the Jews, we made forbidden because of their wrongdoing the, the, the good food that was permissible for them. We did this because they used to do a lot of things that would avert the masses from being guided. So again, it's one thing to be misguided, but to do things to cause other people to go astray, Allah punishes them. Allah says, because they used to take usury, even though they were prohibited from it, and they used to devour the wealth of people, they would they would have these unethical business tricks that they would use to take money from people. They, their goal was to make everyone poor and make themselves rich. You know, doesn't that sound a lot like Wall Street? Yes. So they were very corrupt, economically very corrupt, very unethical in their business dealings. They, they used to, you know, divert the masses from the truth. Allah says, because of that, I imposed many dietary restrictions upon them. So if we go back to the to the verse where Allah speaks about what he pro if you go back to verse number 146 Allah says at the end of the verse we we uh, we impose these restrictions upon them because of their baghi because of their disobedience. Now, if you go to verse 147, So the Prophet, when he told them that, you know, the Prophet would have conversations with them saying that when I'm making halal and when I'm making haram, I'm not abrogating, right? During the time of Ibrahim, this was permissible. So it's not that the Holy Prophet is, you know, inventing these these laws. These laws that you follow, O Bani Israel, they were they came during the time of Musa and they were imposed upon Yaqub. Yaqub imposed it upon himself. فَإِن كَذَّبُوكَ فَقُلْ رَبُّكُمْ ذُو رَحْمَةٍ وَاسِعَةٍ So if they if they meaning the Jews deny you. Or this this could even be a reference to the uh, to the pagans themselves. So if they deny you, O Muhammad, say your Lord is possessed of vast mercy, but his might will not be averted from the guilty people. You know, brothers and sisters, many of the children of Israel, of Israel Bani Israel, some of them said, you know, even if Muhammad is a real prophet, it doesn't matter. Allah is merciful. You know. They commit sin under the pretext that, you know, God is so merciful. How many people are like that today? You know, there are many individuals. Many of you may have heard of Joel, Joel Osteen, right, the preacher. If you listen to a lot of his sermons, he only talks about paradise and that God is love. And that's fine. That's good. But there needs to be balance. You know, sometimes people, they speak so much of God's mercy that it emboldens them to commit sin. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is saying that, yes, Allah possesses vast mercy, but 
his might, his punishment will not be averted from the guilty people. So what this ayah teaches us what? That there has, and there are some people that say, you know, I'll, I eat halal, haram. At the end of the day, Allah is merciful. Yes? I'll listen to music. Allah is merciful. Allah is not going to punish me. The mu'min, my dear brothers and sisters, the heart of the mu'min should always be oscillating between a state of fear and a state of hope. A hadith mentioned that the heart of the mu'min is always between khawf and raja. Fearful of divine wrath, hopeful in divine mercy. So Allah's mercy should never embolden you to disobey. It should inspire you to repent when you commit sin, but not embolden you to disobey. Because yes, Allah is Arhamul Rahimin, Allah is the most merciful, but Allah is also Shadidul Iqab. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he used to say, La tanzur ila sagar Don't look at the insignificance of the sin, but rather, walakin unzur ila man asayt. Look at the majesty and the glory and the might of the one who you are disobeying. So verse 147, a reminder of that balance between fear of God's wrath and hope in His mercy. Verse 148, and we're, and we're running out of time, so I'll try to speed up a little bit. سَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا لَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مَا أَشْرَكْنَا وَلَا آبَاؤُنَا وَلَا حَرَّمْنَا مِنْ شَيْءٍ كَذَلِكَ كَذَّبَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ حَتَّى ذَاقُوا بَأْسَنَا قُلْ هَلْ عِنْدَكُمْ مِنْ عِلْمٍ فَتُخْرِجُوهُ لَنَا إِنْ تَتَّبِعُوا إِلَّا الظَّنِّ وَإِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا تَخْرُصُونَ those who ascribe partners unto God will say, had God willed, we would not have ascribed partners to God, nor our fathers, nor would we have forbidden anything. Those who were before them had similarly denied till they tasted our punishment, our might. Say, do you have any knowledge that you can produce for us? You follow nothing but conjecture and you merely falsify. Now this verse, ayah number 148, resumes its engagement with the Meccans. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here presents a challenge to them, saying to them that you claim, you know, so the, the kuffar, the mushrikeen, they make the following argument. Rasulullah is telling them that there is you only have one God. You know, these are these idols have no power to harm you and no power to bring you any benefit. What what is their answer? That if Allah had willed, we would not ascribe partners to him. So so because we're doing it, it means that it has a religious basis. I mean, talk about a silly argument. If Allah willed, we would not ascribe partners, nor our forefathers. And we would not be able to forbid anything. Now, the argument here is what? That because Allah has not interfered, that means He's pleased with our actions. And this is a common misconception. You know, people often say, if God exists, why is there so much suffering? You know, as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to intervene anytime he sees anything that displeases him. This is similar to saying, when I'm taking an exam, because my teacher didn't slap my hand when I circled the wrong answer, that means it's the right answer. It's an exam. The, the teacher doesn't interfere during the exam. If a teacher moves your hand or slaps your wrist when you circle a wrong answer, do you deserve any merit for circling the right answer? You don't. That's the nature of this life. You're under trial. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't interfere because He wants us to come to Him willingly. He wants us 
to reach our full potential, whether good or bad. And to a certain extent, the statement, some ulama comments that the statement of the kuffar, the mushrikeen, on one level is true. They would not ascribe partners if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't will it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would not be able to disobey him if he didn't give us free will. So when Allah is disobeyed, it's not that he's being overpowered. Because everything else acts in God's obedience. So it is because Allah willed for us to have free will, that is why we are able to disobey. This is why Amir al-Mu'mineen in one hadith, he says, one of the indications that dunya is so low is that it's the only place where God is disobeyed. There is no other realm of existence where Allah is disobeyed. Are there any people disobeying Allah in Barzakh, in the grave, on the Day of Judgment, in Jannah, Jahan? There's no other world where disobedience is possible except in this life. Why? Because Allah granted, He's bestowed free will upon human beings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again at the end of the verse, He asks, قُلْ هَلْ عِنْدَكُمْ مِنْ عِلْمٍ Again, when you make a claim, you have to have, is this based on knowledge? Can you produce knowledge for this claim? Now verse number, verse number 150, am I on verse number 150, 149? 149, yeah. Allah says, قُلْ فَلَوْ شَاءَ لَهَدَاكُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Say with God is the conclusive argument. If he had willed, he could have guided you all. Now, so contrary to the kuffar who say and they do things without any knowledge, without any proof, Allah here says, I am the one that has the conclusive argument. Now, what is the meaning of this verse? And the verse ends by saying that if Allah had willed, He could have guided all of you in the same way that everything else is guided. The sun is guided, the moon is guided, the atoms that make up your body are guided, the plants are guided because they undergo photosynthesis. Every there's hidayah tekwinia everywhere we look. Everything was given its creation. And it was guided towards it, towards its intended purpose. So this guy, this existential guidance exists all around us. Allah says, "I can also extend my guidance to all human beings, to religious guidance, if I willed." But I created a system where human beings are under trial. Now, there's a a couple of hadith that I'd like to share with you, and I, I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to. You know, conclude with this verse because the next verses, it seems they are uh, a bit long. So, uh, so there are two hadith that I'd like to share with you, where the Imams of Ahlul Bayt actually comment on this verse. They speak about the meaning of al hujjatul baligha. What does it mean when Allah says that He has the conclusive argument? That with God is the conclusive argument or the decisive argument. There's a hadith from Imam Musa al kadhim alayhi salam, our seventh Imam, where he says, Inna Allah ala nasi hujjatain, that Allah has two proofs against people. So on the day of judgment, brothers and sisters, you know, everyone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have an argument against everyone to a certain extent. Now Allah may not hold everyone, you know, responsible for following a specific sharia you know perhaps there were people that had no access to god's message but again they still knew enough to be held to some standard to at least a human standard so the imam alayhi salam he says in allah ala nasi hujjatain allah has two proofs against people hujjatun wa hujjatun he has 
an apparent hujja, an external hujja, an external proof, وَحُجَّةٌ بَاطِنَةٌ and an internal proof, and an internal argument. فَأَمَّا الظَّاهِرَ فَالرُّسُلِ وَالْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَالْأَئِمَّةِ As for the outward, the apparent, the external argument against people, it's the messengers, the prophets, and the imams. They're a hujja against us. وَأَمَّا الْبَاطِنَةِ فَالْعُقُولِ As for the hidden, the internal proof against us, it is our intellect. The intellect. So brothers and sisters, this hadith is very profound because even if someone had no access to the divine message, they, they, they knew nothing about Islam. They knew nothing about Rasulullah or the prophets. So Allah may not have that hujjah against them, but if they had a mind, if they had intellect, their hisab on the day of judgment will base will be based on what the intellect dictated to them, and dis and, and what they did, what they went against with respect to what their intellect dictated to them. And there's another hadith from Imam Sadiq where the Imam salam again this is the Imam in this hadith he's giving us an example of Allah having a conclusive argument against his servants on the day of judgment. Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi says, Inna Allah ta'ala yaqulu lil'abd yawm al-qiyamah That Allah will say to his servant on the day of judgment. You know, you and I, people in general. Abdi, akunta aliman, O my servant, were you knowledgeable? Did you have knowledge? Fa'in qala na'am, if the servant says, yes, I was an alim, or I had knowledge, Allah will say to that person, Afala amilta bima alimt. Did you act upon your knowledge? So those who have knowledge will be held accountable. Because the problem with most people is, you know, my you know, I would say that the problem within among Muslims today is not that they necessarily need to know more, they need to practice what they already know. You know, that's why there are some people. They, they, it's as though they need one more measures to get closer to Allah. I just need to learn one, a few more things. Gaining knowledge is important. But, you know, as Ayatollah Bahjit used to say, when, when students would attend his, his classes on akhlaq and spirituality and they would want more lessons, he would ask them, did you apply what I taught you in the previous lesson? You know, you want me to go on? Did you apply what was already discussed? So Allah will say to the one who claimed, Allah will ask, did you have knowledge? If you say yes, Allah will say, did you apply what you knew? If the person says, I was ignorant, so Allah asks, were you knowledgeable? There are two ways to answer. Yes, I was knowledgeable. Allah will say, did you apply what you knew? If you say, I wasn't knowledgeable, I was jahil, I was ignorant. قَالَ لَهُ أَفَلَا تَعَلَّمْتْ حَتَّى تَعْمَنْ The person who will say to Allah on the Day of Judgment that I was ignorant, I didn't know. Allah will say, why didn't you learn? And especially for us living in a time like this, God help us if we say to Allah on the Day of Judgment that I was jahil. Allah will say, what do you mean you were jahil? You had, you know, you, you had an iPhone. You had access to all of this information. You had hundreds of lectures. What were you doing with your life? You were you're ignorant. You didn't know. Maybe someone who's living in the deserts of Arabia, seventh century Arabia, or he's living in the middle of the jungle. Yeah, maybe that guy has an excuse. He's he lives in a remote place before the advent of technology. Yeah, maybe that guy has an excuse. But you and I, to say before Allah on the day of judgment that we were we were jihad, we were ignorant. Allah will say, why didn't you learn so you can practice? And then the Imam says, فَتِلْكَ الْحُجَّةُ الْبَالِغَةِ Imam al-Sadiq says, this is the conclusive argument. Whereby, whatever you answer, Allah will have a reply for you. He will have an argument against you, a hujjah against you, irrespective of what you reply to him on the Day of Judgment. Inshallah, we'll continue our discussion.
next week. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Are there any questions or comments? This week, the, there were a lot of the verses felt like paragraphs, so we weren't <laughs> able to, to get through as much. But I would anticipate that we probably need maybe one or two more sessions and we'll be done with Surah Al-An'am, inshallah. Right, inshallah. inshallah. So then we can go to, to bigger surahs like Surah Al-Feed, inshallah. This right. <laughs> Sorry, we did cattle, we'll go to the elephant next. <laughs> Um, Sheikh, I had a question. So, yes. verse 142 says, eat what Allah has provided for you. And yeah. we also learned that, um, you know, uh, Prophet Yaqub, he would uh, impose uh, restrictions on himself. It seems kind of contradictory as what, well. I wonder if you could throw some light on that. Yeah. So, so the, way, the way we understand Quranic verses is that we have to contextualize them. We have to, in order to understand any verse, you have to put it in its proper context. So in verse number 42, again, this verse comes after a discussion about the dietary restrictions that the Arabs had imposed upon themselves. And when I say dietary restrictions, I don't just mean that, you know, they just chose not to eat certain foods. They would actually consider it forbidden to eat certain foods. And they would, they would make a religious claim to that prohibition. So the ayah is saying that eat of what Allah has provided for you because it's not forbidden. There's no basis for these prohibitions. Now, Ya'qub alayhi salam, you know, when he, and even you know, individuals like Yahya, like Isa alayhi salam, like Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, when they used to refrain from eating certain foods, they did not do it because they believed that it was forbidden. They did it for other reasons. Imam, Imam, Imam Amir al-Mumin, for example, was, you know, especially during his Khilafah, he was the ruler of the entire Muslim empire. He wanted to eat at the same level as the poorest person in the, in, in, uh, in the Muslim uh, empire. Ya'qub, again, these are individuals who, who want to tame their souls. They, they're already avoiding muharramat and makruhat. They want to take it a notch higher and train their souls to not get too comfortable even with halal, you know? So if you discipline yourself to refrain from, from things that are permissible, you're, it's, it's going to become virtually impossible for you to commit something that's makru or haram. So again, this is spiritual training. But, but Ya'qub would never tell you know, you know, others that, this is, that Allah has prohibited this. That's the problem with the pagans. When they would say that this type of meat is not allowed for females, that wasn't just a recommendation. They would consider that religious law. So this is why Allah says, eat of what Allah has provided you. Is it clear? Um, yeah, so basically this is, you know, this is something that basically people were uh, forbidding others from doing, whereas Prophet Yahoo was, this is something that he was doing for himself, but he didn't. He, he, was, he was doing for himself, exactly. All right, thank you. And he was doing it for himself, understanding that those foods are not, they're not prohibited by God. Allah never forbade them. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. So with the, um, the punishment that's <clears throat> imposed on the Jews, the dietary uh, restrictions? Yes. So it seems that um, whereas for us, the punishment is on the Day of Judgment, for them it was given to them on earth. And it's given to all of them, so that means all of them are guilty. Your question, why was it imposed on all of them? Yeah, and on earth, so it's, it's not like for the Day of Judgment, so it's given to them on earth. Oh, okay, I, I, I see your question. So the ulama have understood this, and again, this is, I'm, I'm recalling from Tafasib that I read, you know, years back. So one of the blessings, so, so again, as I mentioned, if you look at the dietary restrictions in Jewish law, it's a lot, it's a lot. I mean, if, if you think, you know, Muslims have it rough, believe me, like if you read what, uh, you know, the, the dietary restrictions of, of, of that's, that have been imposed on the Jews, 
it's a lot more strict. Now, the beauty of Islam is that Islam is known as the religion of ease and leniency. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a lot of things a lot of things permissible. And he did not impose those types of punishments upon Muslims out of respect for the Holy Prophet. So because of Rasulullah is among us and he is the head of this ummah the punishments that were that were imposed on previous nations are not imposed on the ummah of rasulullah because rasulullah is rahmat al so in honor of the holy prophet you know that that's why in islam allah doesn't impose dietary restrictions on us because of our disobedience i mean if, if you look at what the what muslims have done you know i would say that they, they've they've done just as much as Bani Israel, if not even worse. You know, the, the uh, Bani Israel, they used to kill prophets. The Muslims killed, you know, 13 Ma'sumin. So even the Prophet used to say to the to his companions that you will follow the the Sunnah of those who came before you, Shibran bi Shibr wa Dhira'an bi dhira. You will follow everything that previous nations did. To such an extent that even if they were to go into the hole of a lizard, you would do the same. Meaning history is going to repeat itself. The crimes of Bani Israel against their prophets will be repeated by the Muslims against Allah's representatives in their time. So because the Holy Prophet is a Rahmah, Allah didn't send down these types of punishments and restrictions upon the Ummah of Rasulullah. And, that, and that's what makes the Prophet so unique because you know he's rahmatan lil alameen. And even you know, there are verses in the Quran that say that Allah would not punish them as long as they are seeking his forgiveness, and he will not punish them as long as you are among them. So the presence of Rasulullah acted as a deterrent, a repellent for divine punishment. Is it clear? Yeah, I mean that's one part of it. The, the part about the, the Jews is still um, because uh, when they are punished, it's the punishment is on all of them equally. So they are punishment. equally guilty and hundred percent guilty. Now again, you know, when Allah imposes a restriction, you know, number one, the majority of them were guilty. You know, and, and this is something that's common in in almost every era. It's only a handful of you know uh, believers. Who are committed, who are devoted to the prophets. So when Allah imposes this this uh, this restriction, it applies it applies to everybody. But it's not a punishment for the believers. There is a benefit for them. You know, it, perhaps it can elevate their spirituality if they follow these uh, restrictions, despite the fact that they didn't disobey. It will amplify the reward for them. But again, like this is also to instill. In us the sense of community that you know when when the majority of the community fails we should consider it a fail it should be considered a failure on, on everybody that's why in surah al-fatiha when we stand before god even when you're praying furada you say what guide us you're it's but it's only you you know especially if you're praying fajr you're you're speaking to god alone you don't say guide me to the straight path or it is you who, who I seek. You know, you're using the plural because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He want the goal of sending prophets is to create a righteous society, not just a righteous individual. That's why in Quran, if you read, when Allah speaks about people entering paradise, He doesn't talk about individuals. He says, Mu'mineen are taken into paradise as groups. Surah Al-Zumar refers to this, that they go into Jannah as large groups. Because the journey towards God is a communal journey. Therefore, our failures are communal failures. And our successes are communal successes. So it's to kind of instill that sense of community. So community has its, 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 its good times and its bad times. You know, when the community flourishes, we all flourish. When the community fails, we all suffer. That's just the nature of, of, uh, 
of community. Is that clear? Um, Sheikh, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, I remember learning a while back that isn't there a principle in like Islamic jurisprudence that if a practice is widely adopted by the ulama, then that's considered an evidence for it to be correct? Yes. That Doesn't that kind of seem to contradict some of the stuff over here where it says that, hey, you're just following what other people are doing, but without... Um, um, you answer the question yourself. If, if ulama, if pious scholars accept a practice as as being widely uh, as, as you know they, they practice a certain thing then that is an indication that they must have had access to uh, to a hadith that is no longer with us for example and this this is something that's discussed in usul usul al fiqh for example if if we see in the books of in, in the in the books of jurisprudence that all of the ulama prohibit a certain act but we don't have any hadith that says that their consensus is an indication that this must have come from the ma'soom but we just don't have a hadith because because otherwise there's no way to explain that consensus you know what i mean but the consensus has to be among scholars not just among common folk so the idea is that there must have been proof at some point in time in the past, but we've lost it at this point. But yeah, exactly. Okay. Sheikh, thank you so much for your time and for all this, uh, for these lectures. Thank you so much. Please keep me in your dua, and inshallah, we're, this is, we're, at, we're at the fourth quarter, inshallah. Last few minutes of the fourth quarter, we'll be yeah. done with uh, Surah al Allah bless you guys, and uh, inshallah, we will continue uh, next week. Inshallah. Thank you, Shay. Yes, I'll come down, Inshallah. Awesome.